You're watching This Week in Louisiana Politics with Fred Childers. Good morning to you. Hope you're having a wonderful Sunday so far. I'm Fred Childers. Thanks for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Politics on your local election headquarters. Well, more than $2 billion are coming from the federal government to fund flooding and hurricane protection projects across the state. Political reporter Shannon Heck spoke with some of our federal lawmakers who have been pushing to get these projects some attention. 98 miles of levees, floodgates and other protections for the Morganza on the Gulf project will be getting $379 million. These protections will help hold off flooding and future hurricanes in the area where Hurricane Ida made a direct hit at landfall. The federal government has been largely on the sidelines for this project. We finally broke the log jam last year and we're able to get the first year ever of construction funds and now we're seeing the larger dollars come in. A federal, state and local partnership was made to kick off the construction of this project to oversee its creation in Louisiana's fragile marshlands. This wave of funds is also going to a number of other protection projects such as reducing flooding along Highway 90. That road, which is a major four lane U.S. highway, was underwater even before Hurricane Ida made landfall. And so it, you couldn't pass it in, in some of the areas. There will be more opportunities to invest in coastal restoration of barrier islands and marshes. And some of the funds from the supplemental disaster bill are rolling in to help pick up the pieces from Hurricane Ida, Laura and Delta. This disaster aid is critical in rebuilding after Ida and there's more to do. Congressman Graves says that multiple projects did not make it onto the list for the funding this time, but he is continuing to work to get them funded. For your local election headquarters, I'm Shannon Hecht. Other funds from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is going towards Louisiana's efforts to expand broadband to rural areas. The Granting Unserved Municipalities Broadband Opportunities Program, that's also known as GUMBO, grant launched after the 2021 legislative session. Now it aims to bring connectivity to areas of the state that have little to no service. When we're thinking about telemedicine, um, you know, distance learning, um, running these businesses from home. There's so many opportunities uh, for our citizens, but uh, it starts with broadband infrastructure. So with the new allocation of money from the federal government, they will be able to take in more applications. Now, the next wave are due in July 23rd. 23 providers have signed up to help serve the 58 parishes that have already applied. Last week, the pre-filing of bills for the 2022 legislative session began. Some of the first ones that have rolled in include a bill by Representative Philip Tarver to shrink the Bessie board to eight members and get rid of the members appointed by the governor. A House resolution by Barry Ivey would ban schools from removing unvaccinated kids from class if there is an outbreak of COVID-19. More bills will steadily come in over the coming weeks leading up to the session and that begins on March 14th. We'll, of course, keep an eye on all those bills for you. New leadership is in place for Louisiana's Black Caucus. A new chairman has been named at the state legislature. He is State Representative Vincent Pierre from Lafayette. You see you there. He will replace outgoing Representative Ted James, who will now be the Region 6 Director for the Small Business Administration, a position he was appointed to by President Joe Biden. Meanwhile, Republicans for the state GOP have re-elected a chairman, Louis Gervich. The embattled chairman gets another term after a very narrow victory. The advocate reported the vote was 101 to 90. Gervich seemingly addressing the nail bite biter, saying the stakes are too great to let the party devolve into infighting. Well, Gary Chambers, who is running against Senator John Kennedy for his seat in the U.S. Senate, is making waves after his latest ad showing him smoking marijuana. Shannon Hecht takes a look at the significance of the ad and Louisiana's relationship with marijuana in the legislature. 
Senate candidate Gary Chambers is making national headlines with his new ad. Pictured smoking a rolled blunt, he talks about the estimated 7.3 million people who have been arrested for possession of marijuana since 2010, according to the ACLU. Chambers is a candidate that comes with name recognition already, and this move highlights the country's and the state's relationship with marijuana. Currently, medical marijuana is legal in Louisiana, but recreational use is still illegal. I think a big part of this in the next couple of years is going to be just having really honest conversations about a disproportionate impact on various communities that the current system has. Statistics collected in March of 2021 by JMC Analytics shows that 67 percent of the 1,100 Louisianians polled are in favor of decriminalizing and legalizing weed. Looking at making sure that we can reduce, if not eliminate, uh, incarceration as a potential punishment in many cases. Louisiana Progress is working on a number of ideas to bring marijuana legislation back to the 2022 session. Last year, the Sheriff's Association played a big role in stopping a bill that would have led to legalization, saying it's still a Schedule One drug federally. Um, there does seem to be broad openness to further decriminalization. The Louisiana GOP and Senator John Kennedy did not immediately reply for comment on Chambers' ad. In Baton Rouge, I'm Shannon Hecht for Fox 44 News. Now, following that ad by Gary Chambers, Governor John Bell Edwards was asked how he felt about it on his monthly radio show, Ask the Governor on WRKF. Governor Edwards said the uh, imagery of smoking weed is not something that should be celebrated. While he is against legalizing marijuana, he did sign a bill to decriminalize possession of small amounts of weed. In the same show, Governor Edwards all but endorsed Chambers' opponent, Luke Mixon. I'm particularly impressed by the credentials of, of uh, Luke Mixon uh, here from uh, in, in this area now, but but uh, someone who was educated at, at the Naval Academy, which is kind of hard for me <laughs> being a West Point graduate, uh, but his service to the country uh, as a fighter pilot, uh, for example, uh, and in his uh, stand on the issues, uh, mm -hmm. so, sort of uh, as, as best I can tell, at least, uh, very similar to mine in terms of, of, of being a, a Democrat, a moderate Democrat, and, and quite frankly, I'm, um, I'm attracted to his candidacy. So, not official, he declined to fully endorse Mixon. The fighter pilot from Bunky is up against Senator John Kennedy, who has already announced his re-election campaign and has been endorsed by former President Donald Trump. Coming up, it's been a full year since Biden became president. Everyone is taking a look at his record so far. We'll have a breakdown on the other side of this break. Stay with us. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. Well, it's been one year in office for President Joe Biden, and in that year, Louisiana has been through a lot. Now, this week, President Biden reflected on his first year in office. Mark Rigsby looks back on what the administration has done for Louisiana. We have faced some of the biggest challenges that we've ever faced in this country these past few years. Challenges to our public health, challenges to our economy, but we're getting through it. Louisiana Republican Senator John Kennedy, never at a loss for words, says he's disappointed with President Biden's first year in office. I think President Biden is a nice guy, but he keeps doing stupid stuff. And, and a fair-minded person would have to conclude after one year in office that 
he uh, he runs a tight shipwreck. Let's revisit the president's efforts here in Louisiana. The president used the aging Calcasieu River Bridge in Lake Charles in May of 2021 as the backdrop to first pitch his trillion dollar infrastructure plan to America. That's a perfect example how we've neglected as a nation to invest in the future of our economy. A slightly smaller version of the plan was passed by Congress. Louisiana will now get billions of dollars to rebuild bridges and support several projects to protect against future hurricanes and floods. Folks, I know you're hurting. I know you're hurting. The president toured storm damage in Louisiana in September of 2021 after deadly Hurricane Ida, one of the strongest storms in U.S. history. It caused billions of dollars in damage. FEMA and the Small Business Administration combined have handed out billions in recovery money to pay for it. The America Rescue Plan last year allowed early child tax credit payments on a monthly basis for Louisiana families, helping more than one million children. And the state continues to benefit from COVID relief. So where has the president dropped the ball? Louisiana Republican Senator Bill Cassidy says handling the high rate of inflation that currently exists. That has an incredibly negative impact upon somebody's household budget. The, the people who are eating steak are now eating hamburger, and the people eating hamburger are eating hot dogs. And if you're eating hot dogs, I don't know what you're, 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 you're eating vegetables. So I think that has been the biggest failure to kind of uh, uh, let that sneak out. All right, the Louisiana Democratic Party points to some of the successes of the administration. There were 25,000 new businesses, unemployment claims down. Uh, 30,000 jobs added, child poverty reduced, and millions vaccinated. The president has also tapped former New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landrieu to oversee the infrastructure plan rollout. Well, coming up, Shannon sits down with Public Affairs Research Council to talk about the big looming debate over redistricting. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. We're just a couple weeks away from the redistricting session that's set to take place at the beginning of February. And I want to talk about some of what we might see during those discussions. I'm joined by Stephen Procopio, who's the president of PAR Louisiana. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Shannon. So you guys have been putting out a couple of reports before we go into this redistricting session. And I want to talk about some of the key things that we've been taking away from the, the redistricting roadshow that's been all over the state. Can you hit some of those key points? Sure. Uh, I mean, some of the big issues, uh, you know, we've been trying to emphasize that plus give people background because this only happens once a decade. Uh, so some of the big issues we see, I think most of the attention is going to be around Congress. Uh, because that's you know what people are most familiar with. It's, it's going to be the most controversial. Uh, the, one of the biggest issues there is whether or not we'll have an additional uh, majority minority district. We already have uh, one in uh, District Two. Uh, the issues is, will there be an additional one? And the argument goes is that out of the six districts, um, you know, two would be a third uh, of all the districts. And a third is about what the African-American population is of Louisiana. And so that logic kind of follows. Uh, and, and it makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, redistricting is, is a complicated issue of a lot of factors going into it. So we're going to have to see how that plays out. Right. That There's been a lot of discussion around, I believe, it's Garrett Graves District and Troy Carter and kind of how those are carved out around New Orleans and Baton Rouge. So where can we see maybe potentially the biggest changes in the drawing of those districts based on what we've seen with the population changes? Well, with the population changes, you're going to, uh, there are two issues. There are population changes, 
so that you're going to have to a, a shift away from rural areas, which you got less populated into urban areas. And so they have to make that adjustment regardless, because they have to have equal size districts. And so that's one dynamic that the legislature's got to deal with. And then if you, on top of that, want to make uh, an additional uh, uh, African-American district, then you're going to have to go where the African-American voters are. And so that might be eating into Garrett Graves' district. Uh, it might be going up a more and possibly grabbing districts from North Louisiana, and maybe the Monroe area. I mean, there are a couple of maps that have been proposed, uh, and it's really a, a lot of different issues. Some of it is how much of our minority district do you want to have or is is 55 percent okay or do you want to have a greater um uh you know cushion uh in order to deal with a lower voter turnout or something along those lines and there's been a lot of talk of the northern district since there's been such a great population loss from up there and about how much of the fourth and fifth districts should really be going to each other so are we going to see maybe some of those districts shrink um, or maybe pick up some more land to kind of get that uh, population even between all the districts? So the w one issue could be, or one, one proposal might be to sort of combine those two districts in North Louisiana uh, and have sort of a one smaller um, but coherent Northern district. Probably due to politics, that's not going to happen. I don't think the, the representatives want to see that happen. I don't think the state legislators in North Louisiana want to see that happen. Uh, so what will happen is those districts will actually probably get geographically larger as they uh, come down to make up some of the lost population that they can come down into the Acadiana or Lake Charles region. Uh, so if they don't handle it in something like that, they're just going to have to sort of keep moving towards South Louisiana. And I think the key term really for this session is going to be that minority majority districts. It's not only in the congressional ones, but it's also in the Supreme Court, as well as the Bessie board that I have seen that people are really pushing to have an additional minority majority district. And so can you see that potentially being a bit of a difficult get this time around for those different uh, you know, sections? So uh, I agree. It, it could be very difficult uh, in a really two broad sets of issues. One is just redistricting is difficult. There are a lot of things you have to have happen. You have to make equal sized districts. You can't stretch them too far and be accused of being uh, gerrymandering. You want to have competitive districts. Uh, so there are a lot of things that are going on that are competing values. Uh, on, and the other strike against it is uh, politics, uh, particularly at the congressional level. There's going to be a lot of national pressure for Republicans not to give up uh, an additional seat. Um, so it, that's not one at parse necessarily concerned with, but there are actually many reasons, uh, you know, legitimate reasons why it's going to be difficult. Uh, my hope is that they at least get a very serious look uh, at all of these levels and including, you know, you make Bessie, um, but also in the Supreme Court, but also just the uh, Louisiana legislature. When they go to look at those seats, you can see some districts that have 70, 80 percent African-American. Uh, is there a way that maybe that could be, um, you know, lowered and create more competitive districts? I mean, I don't know. I don't have an answer, but it's something I think I, I, I really think the legislature needs to have a serious look at. And if they don't do it, they need to have a very good answer on why they weren't able to achieve. It. And I was looking at your report. And one of the things that I saw was that the, the House, I know the Republicans are going to be trying to get that super majority. They need about two seats, correct? And so where are some of those districts that they're looking to, you know, maybe pick up that ground? But it sounds like, you know, there's been such a shift that there is more uh, you know, with the redrawing, it would make these districts more competitive for Republicans than Democrats. Would so so to, to give context that the Louisiana legislature right now has a uh, the Republican Party has a supermajority or a two thirds vote uh, in the Senate. But you do not have it in the Louisiana House. It is very close. So they just need to pick up a few more. And redistricting could be eyed as a way to get that done. Um, it becomes difficult um, because then you also have, um, you know, it could mean that they have to pack more people into Democratic districts. Now, it's not illegal to pack people according to party, but it is illegal to pack people according to race. Uh, and so that would be racial gerrymandering, in, in which case uh, you would have that probably struck down by the courts. Uh, ha uh, however, there's a great deal of overlap between race and party in Louisiana. Um, it, so it, it's going to be difficult. Uh, to try and gain it strictly through redistricting. Um, the other dynamic here is you have, and I think probably the overarching dynamic is you have all of these legislators that are gonna wanna make sure they protect their seats. So they know what their districts are, they like their districts, 
uh, and they don't want to get moved around or thrown into a, a district with another incumbent. So I think that's going to be priority number one, uh, is making sure their seats are at least proximately close to what they have now. Right. Well, that's a lot of moving dynamics we're going to be looking at here with these key points. Uh, I also want to touch on you have a, one more report coming out about transparency, correct, before we head into this session. Right. Our, our first one is really giving people an overview. And then this last time was sort of the main issues. You know, if it was a sporting event, this would be like your guide talking about what, what's going to happen in your scouting report. Uh, and then our next one is actually be on our recommendations. And it's going to be recommendations on how they can have a, a fair, transparent process. Uh, we'll have some very specific things we'd like to see them do at the committee level in terms of presenting maps and make sure those things are available for citizens. You know, this is, redistricting is quite different than it has been in the past. The technology is so much better. People can follow along. They can create their own maps and submit them, which is completely different. And, you know, we've actually had a couple of people sit in the map session and showed us what they've done. And it's really encouraging to see that level of participation. Um, and our next one is going to be specifically how that the legislature and the governor uh, can make sure this goes through and have a fair process. And in addition, uh, we're going to have a webinar. Uh, it's actually the first webinar PAR has ever done. Uh, so we're going to have that, and it's going to be on the Friday after redistricting starts. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to have the chairs of the governmental committees that are responsible for drawing it. And so, uh, you know, I encourage people to uh, get informed of that process as well. All right, Stephen, well, thank you for joining us, and we will hear from you at the Baton Rouge Press Club tomorrow, right? Monday? That's correct. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to that. All right, well, we look forward to more information, and we'll be in touch with you as we get into this redistricting session. Uh, thanks. Anytime, Shannon. Sure thing. We'll be right back. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. Looking ahead to the coming week, PAR President Stephen Procopio, who you just heard from, will be speaking at the Baton Rouge Press Club tomorrow about redistricting and highlighting key points of the state's budget. Also tomorrow, the Senate Select Committee on State Police Oversight meets again to follow up on the ongoing investigation into the agency's policies. The Legislative Committee on the Budget will present the executive budget for the next fiscal year on Tuesday. We'll cover that as well. Thank you for joining us for this week in Louisiana politics. I'm Fred Childers. Stay safe, stay informed, and I'll see you next Sunday right here on your local election headquarters.